presenters tonight, uh, Dustin and Nicole, are uh, students from my History 469 uh, last, last fall. And we devoted that, uh, that course to uh, uh, researching using newspapers, um, uh, towns in, in Washington, uh, because we have a good deal of uh, microfilm at, uh, at Holland. So uh, I assign or students pick uh, cities in Washington that have uh, have newspapers that go back to 1918 and so I think you read what 16 months yes. of uh, newspaper uh, <clears throat> Nicole did Colfax and Dustin did uh, Pullman and on top of that they had a, a range of uh, standardized readings from uh, various scholars in the country to, to pro uh, provide a backdrop and so on and uh, <clears throat> some of them used uh, materials from uh, mask and so on and so forth this is kind of the bugaboo class for students. You know, they all uh, enjoy sitting down, taking midterms and finals, and fill in the blank and 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 uh, uh, multiple choice. Quit. But but here you have to generate a paper. So what they did was uh, a couple of them went a little overboard. Uh, how many pages was yours? Fifty-five. <laughs> a, little over, a little overboard. Yeah, it was. I said twenty-five. Uh, I was happy, and she went a little crazy. And I think Dustin was a little more. Uh, uh, Considerate of my eyes, forty, forty. <laughs> but they're uh, they're they're very appealing papers. Uh, they have nice uh, graphics, um, um, and uh, throughout the whole process, what they did was I, I had them uh, do uh, in a sense PowerPoint uh, presentations. Probably maybe the third or fourth class, and <clears throat> every day, that, uh, every week we met, we simply went through them so that. They got accustomed to uh, to doing this, so so they're in charge of their PowerPoint and, and their, their, their their topic. They've uh, done this several times. Uh, I uh, I think they'll aim at about a half hour, and uh, as as we proceed, you'll realize why Dustin going first makes sense and then why Nicole going uh, second uh, uh, follows. Uh, Dustin is a history major. He's also a political science and. Uh, military science minor. Um, he's a cadet in Army ROTC. Um, and one of his cohorts here, <laughs> Christian Duplacy, is here uh, to, to keep him from being nervous. <clears throat> um, and you're going to graduate and be commissioned? In December. Oh, in December. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, so you'll be around a bit then. Yep. Nicole, you're, you're graduating then? December. De oh, December too? Yeah, I'm here oh, my student okay. teaching next month. Okay, I, here I thought I read your. your uh, your resume as well. Uh, in in, um, in Nicole's case, she's a social uh, uh, studies uh, uh, teaching major, and uh, uh, she uh, um, did you spend a whole year in Ireland? Uh, just a semester. Semester in, in Galway. Yeah. Yeah. Ask her how uh, many countries she's been to. Uh, uh, how many countries have you been to? Uh, he asked you. Thirty-one. Thirty-one. <laughs> well. Uh, that's going to be a nice uh, uh, addition to a classroom when you can walk in a classroom and boast about 31 countries. He'll probably catch up with you, but for different reasons. Yeah, because I'm going to keep going. I'll keep going, okay. Yeah. Well, we can see that with the, the latecomers, we can finally get started now that uh, Steve and, and, and Ed are here, so I'll try to embarrass them by them coming in late. So, okay, I think I'll just uh, ask him to, to start. And we're, we're shooting for about a half hour each. And I might take a question or two if there's just a burning question that you just can't sit through another one with. Otherwise, we'll cut away toward the end. But I'd rather not get into a lengthy discussion. But as I say, if there's a, a question you just have to ask before Nicole, you, you may. Okay? Anyways, uh, thank you, Dr. Spiggin. So as he introduced, my name is Dustin Dennis. I've been here for now two and a half years. Uh, I immediately went into the Army Reserve out of high school, and I've been enlisted almost four years. And while I've been at college, I've been attending the ROTC program so that I might be, achieve an Army commission, hopefully active duty. Um, so that's just a little bit more about myself. Now, for the actual presentation, as you can tell just by the opening slides and a little bit of background that we've given, it's on the impact of the Spanish influenza and how it affected Pullman specifically. Now, I, because of my general nature and obviously my job, I focus a little bit more on the military side of how that actually impacted the city and how all the influences from the Great War that were going on at the time actually made it so that influenza was either more dramatic or less dramatic in the area. Um, so go ahead and hit the next slide. So I found what I thought this was this really, really cool map that showed the actual nature and how the counties were distributed and how everything was going down at the time for 1918. Um, 
This also has a little bit of just basic information. My newspaper was the Pullman Herald, which was actually discontinued. Um, so what we have is all that's pretty much left of it as well. There are some, uh, I believe the Historical Society actually has some of the original copies, and I know the library does as well. Um, so I thought that was really interesting, and I specifically like Pullman, one, because I've been here for a while now, and two, because I thought it was going to be a very interesting way of looking at the impact the college had for on influenza and on the military. So going into the next slide, what we're going to start with actually is a little bit more context for everything going into it. At the time, at the start of 1918, America had pretty much just gotten into World War I, or the Great War as it's more commonly known, and America didn't really have much involvement with influenza. In fact, influenza hadn't really popped up on anyone's mind come January. It wouldn't be for another almost four to five months that influenza even actually developed in any sort of way. So what I have for the first couple months of my research into the Pullman Herald was simple things that actually would come to have a dramatic effect later. So for example, we have our first Red Cross election, which came a, became a massive institution that dealt with you know, world, uh, the World War, getting out supplies and medical supplies to the area, dealing with trauma, getting volunteers and uh, medical experts to go to the front and go to the battle, which actually had a big effect because it stole all the doctors. Mm -hmm. So we also had the influence that started to be with the college. So um, Washington State College, because it hadn't become a university yet, had actually developed and pretty much became the precursor for what is now the Army ROTC program that is there. Previously, they had what was essentially an Army cadet program, but not ROTC, because that hadn't been developed yet, which was at the start of the institution of the college in 19, uh, 1896, which gave the Army its first officers. It was actually considered, since it was a land-grant university or a land-grant college, it was required by the United States government to produce military officers for the actual uh, U.S. Army. So. It's very interesting and it makes it very important to understand that the military had always been a part of the college and that meant that there was going to be an influence in the military when the uh, Great War actually took off. What happened is they developed this thing known as this uh, SATC. Uh, essentially what it is is the Student Army Training Corps, which uh, was a way to develop soldiers who were both enlisted and officers to develop men so that they would have enough in, uh, personnel to go to battle. So next, again, because there was very little that had anything to do with influenza, which was what our topic focused, we had to start looking at all the little things going into the very intricate little parts of what people would go and submit to the newspaper. So for example, Miss W.C. Krugel, and I, I apologize, I will probably mess up names, I'm not very good with pronunciation, as he's going to comment on my pronunciation of Greg? Greg. Greg. Yeah, that's good. Anyways. Um, and which we commonly associate as another name for the common cold at the time. So next slide, please. So going into April and May, again, we haven't had a lot of information going down. Influenza hadn't developed yet, and we hadn't had to worry about anything that was going to cause a major catastrophe. So we have little things, um, for example, deaths caused by things that aren't associated with what common cold or other things such as the type of pneumonia that would come in, which was a precursor to the actual influenza, which we have multiple stories in May. Now, if you actually go back two slides. Oop, one slide, sorry. As we talked about here, the influx of soldiers expected for May. So what that was, now go back. <laughs> so what that was is it meant that May was when there was going to be a large influx of enlisted soldiers into Pullman, specifically to attend the college in its off months so that they could receive technical training. Things like vehicle maintenance, uh, farming and other tools usage, things that would give them skills and abilities they could take to the front and actually use there. So as we see with the influx of soldiers, this is when the very first inklings of Spanish influenza developed. And the reason I say that is because we started to have a few little cases of pneumonia, other little things. So this was where at first we got our actual exposure to it. Now, if we actually talk about and we look at the supplemental readings that we had, such as Crosby or Gina Colada, who actually had a very good book on the flu itself, we realized that it was the soldiers who actually traveled from the United States to France to actually go and have battle that brought the very first strain of influenza with them. So it's actually now commonly believed that influenza developed in the United States, was taken overseas, where it was kind of put through the virtual gauntlet of having been surrounded by war, which is a relative putri dish for disease. And um, 
It was then brought back with soldiers who were returning home to have the effect that it did in, in the later half of 1918. So this influx of soldiers actually made it so that we had a large group in this one, uh, about 30, sorry, I understand these are hard to read. 3,500 uh, soldiers were coming in. Um, so a very large thing, uh, group, because at the time the population of Pullman was about the same number. So it was very low. They almost doubled the size of the city. So imagine that if you're thinking of things like logistics or actually how, how do you house all these people. Essentially what they did is they took over the entire college and officers and higher enlisted were roomies, if roommates, and they actually had gotten uh, to stay with local families. So you had uh, people who would rent out homes, rent out rooms, and you'd get a lot of exposure with the soldiers in town because at this time there was no restrictions on anything. So they were able to mingle with the population and actually mingle with civilians at their, uh, at their leisure. So Can I ask you before you choose that? Yes, what sorry. is the death caused by... So, um, I can't actually pronounce this, but it's actually, it's, um, it's a skin disease that was commonly found in pigs. Or syphilis parasites. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it was a skin disease that was commonly found in pigs. I have it on here, one, because it was actually the first death that was really in the paper at the time. And two, because it actually has a big point of showing that disease is transferable between animals and humans. So since a d disease is transferable, it's commonly believed that influenza didn't come from humans, it was developed in animals. And that animals switched over and actually carried it with them and that's how we got it. So next slide please. So June, we had nothing, not a single thing. It was very interesting because Pullman was at the t uh, height of its health. So right here, I'm actually gonna talk about Pullman itself. It was important for very, for two different reasons to the United States government at the time. It was an agricultural center, which is the primary reason. It was the largest producer of grain pretty much in the United States. It, everything had gone through the Palouse, everything was going through this area, Colfax, the surrounding area, so that they actually were producing a severe, severe amount, that's not the right word, producing a large amount of uh, agricultural products for the United States Army so that they could be shipped overseas and so that they could sustain the populace in areas that don't uh, actually produce their own uh, subsidies for food. Um, so that was very important. So the other reason was because of the college itself, as I already discussed. The college became a, a ground for training for the United States military. So this, I want to point out, was this ad in the paper showing that the schools and Pullman itself were in very good shape. They were very healthy. There was no issues. And this was actually a drive for two reasons. It was hoping that they could snag some of the soldiers who had been there to stay. <coughs> At this time, Pullman was a growing community and they wanted to bring in people so that they might actually have more, eh, more prosperous in the future. So what that meant is if they could snag soldiers or snag, snag other people to stay in the area, locally settle, they might actually have a bigger population and a more prosperous future to come. So this is going to be very important later when we actually see what goes what goes on. So then we have a death in July, which I put down because I believed it was a precursor to influenza. They didn't actually comment on what she died of, only that it was lung trouble. So that lead, led me to believe that it had something to do along the lines of pneumonia, which was very common at the time, or some other flu-related disease, because that's what we have the context of the time to understand. So next slide. Okay, now August to September. This is interesting because, again, there's not much on it. That's two entire months leading up to what <coughs> is going to be one of the most severe months Pullman has actually ever experienced, which is October. So at this time, we only have one thing that actually came out of the paper that was very important and very uh, good to understand, and that was G.W. Bowen, um, I hope, who was an older woman who actually uh, passed away from tuberculosis which was another thing at the time was a precursor to influenza. Um, so what's important to understand about influenza also is that when it first came around, here, next slide, October, nobody really knew what it was. It, they weren't quite certain, so they started uh, diagnosing with pretty much ev everything. Typhoid, tuberculosis, pneumonia, grip. So if they had an idea, they threw a name at it and hope it stuck. Simply because they didn't know what they were combating. At the time, as we also learned, doctors hadn't discovered viruses yet. Spanish influenza is the A strain of the H1N1 virus. 
So no one had actually understood what was going on. They all thought it was bacteria because that was the discovery of the time. They knew what bacteria was and that's how they could combat it. But since viruses are much smaller, scientists hadn't de developed technology that they could understand what a virus was. So they started throwing names at it. They had no idea what it was. October is important because that's when soldiers really started coming back from their first contact with the front and bringing Spanish influenza, which was at the time causing thousands upon thousands of casualties in the Western theater. They brought it back and that's when it started to hit the country. So we learned through our studies, actually, not yet. we learned through our studies yet that there were other cities such as uh, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Boston, these other major cities where these big port cities as well, that soldiers were coming back across that were hit very, very hard. They were the ones that absorbed the true brunt of the impact because that's where relatively first contact is for the United States. Um, as we discovered in one of our, or read in one of our other readings by Alfred Crosberry, uh, Virgin Soil Epidemics, which explains that when you have no natural immunities to anything, it kind of goes through a population very rapidly. So his topic and his uh, article was actually about the spread of smallpox and other uh, diseases to Native Americans with the uh, bringing of colonists. So it tied in very well to this because you can pretty much call Spanish influenza in October a virgin soil epidemic. There was no natural immunities to it almost and had a very high casualty rate. So October 4th is when we have our first death that is directly attributed to Spanish influenza. As you can see, Glenn Patton, a 19-year-old high school student, died suddenly. So that one statement is very important and very critical to understand. Spanish influenza struck fast. It normally targeted the young and people my age, and the generally healthiest group in America, the ones you would never attribute to falling subject to such a disease. And it struck, since it struck so quickly, they had no real idea of trying to understand it. A person could be healthy on Tuesday, and by Thursday or Friday, they're now dead. So it's very important to look at that and understand that because it was so fast and so violent, it was making such a large impact on the country. So going further into October or same day, we have more people coming down with things that they are attributing to typhoid or Spanish influenza. And then again, on October 11th, this was actually from the United States government. It was the Surgeon General who put out 12 ways to combat Spanish influenza. So at, in October, that's when influenza reached Pullman. Yet at the time, it had already been going through the country for several months. So they had started to understand it slowly. But in Pullman, since no one had actually heard of it at all, they had just had this published because it was pushed out from the Surgeon General to Washington State, and then Washington State pushed it out as a general thing to all of its cities. So in this article, it's very long actually, it incorporated 12 ways that they thought they could combat it, which a big one was covering your mouth. They thought that at the time that the spread of bacteria and phlegm and things like that was what was the biggest tribute to how uh, Spanish influenza was spread. The only issue with that is that a cotton uh, mouth or surgeon mask actually doesn't have a small enough filter to catch viruses. So next slide, please. So going into October, we start to have a big, big impact. It's, or sorry, middle of October. Um, October 11th, in, I'm going to hopefully get these all correct, is that's when the first um, actual quarantine was placed on Pullman. So Pullman had understood that this disease was now coming. They had been, received a warning from their Surgeon General, ways to combat it. And one of the very first and only methods that was being proven effective in other cities was a quarantine. So this was a full city quarantine which restricted the military to only the campus of the college and it restricted all uh, citizens and civilians to stay within their houses and not go out to any of their public gatherings such as pool halls, bars, uh, primitive theaters, or anything like that. They were required to stay at home unless they had a medical emergency at which point they would contact someone, hopefully a friend, or because there was no real medical services there, uh, within Pullman itself. So also on October 11th, the Army stops all transfers to Pullman. So prior to that, the original plan by the military was to only keep soldiers within Pullman from roughly May until August, which is what we have as our summer months, 
for the college so that they wouldn't actually stop the college from undergoing its classes in its normal school year. But as the war kept progressing, they decided that they needed to keep the soldiers there that they could receive training. But it was this transfer of soldiers within that actually brought influenza to Pullman. Because at the time, the only truly mobile population in the United States was the military. There were people that would go out individually to visit cities, go to Spokane, maybe all the way to, Pullman, or to uh, Portland, or maybe even Seattle. There, they had relatives in other states, but it was really the military that was so mobile. It's what brought it from France. It's what brought it to France. So it's very important to understand that it was the military and their transfers, such as in and out of Pullman, that actually brought influenza to the area. So that didn't actually stop the fact that 600 more men were coming into the city. At this time, they had roughly 1,400 uh, soldiers left in the area. But this new detachment of 1600, or 600 men was going to bring in roughly 1100, or 100 actual carriers of influenza at the time. So going into October 18th, we actually had the first posting of an actual number by the newspaper of how many cases they were. So the cases that they brought up meant individuals who had died, not just individuals who had it. So at the time uh, we had of October 18th, that's 25 new cases since last week, but it's actually 42 new cases in total since October. So what it meant is that by, in the course of roughly three weeks, they had already had 42 cases of Spanish influenza, which is a very fast transmission. That, mean, that is a very quick disease. That normally it does not happen that quickly when you talk about modern colds or anything of that nature. So also on October 18th, we had a very large mistake happen or a very large thing that probably would have been best if it had not happened. The college decided to lift the ban against the county medical officer's recommendation. They were very conscious of the fact that they had their classes being stopped and hoped that they wanted, they wanted to make it so that everything was get started again. So they lifted it after roughly a week, which really didn't help the situation at all. What it did is it made the campus more mobile where the soldiers were, got the soldiers back into the town. Story follows. So next slide, please. Okay, so October 18th, again, because uh, we had in this time period, this was a weekly, we had a lot of different cases that would be displayed at one point. We had a death of another young uh, woman at this time, uh, and the paper would often describe them by either their husband or their, uh, their status of uh, being a parent or not. So we had the death of another young woman, very healthy at the time, so again, another iteration of how it would target young, healthy people. Um, and as I put again, there was another uh, bulletin put out by the U U.S. Health Department, or the actual start to the U.S. Health Department, the U.S. Public Health Services, that would post it another way of how to either combat influenza and the best methods to be able to hopefully isolate it and stop it from spreading. So in the next week, October 25th, the college closes down again. They had, at that time, within that week, they had a rapid wave of more people coming down with influenza. And so what they did is they actually had to close the campus so that they would be able to hopefully stop the disease from spreading anymore. Next slide, please. Okay, so I also want you guys to understand one thing. Um, because at the time the United States was in a state of war, propaganda was a very huge thing. Many people attributed influenza as an actual weapon by the Germans in the hopes that people would be more willing to fight them, I guess, to get the, the fighting spirit of the United States raising and ready to go. So there was articles that would come out about how influenza was a result of the Germans. And this article actually specifically <coughs> says, hey, influenza isn't real. It's actually the Kaiser who brought this up, and this is just a normal cold. So, conspiracy. <laughs> yes, a conspiracy. So here, though I apologize, a lot of these, since they come from microfilm, they're not exactly the highest quality. And I, I did try to get them larger and actually make it so that they were very well, uh, easy to read. But here we had another death count of what was going on with uh, since the last week. So if you remember last week there was 42, now there's another 11 cases. So that brings it up to 53. So it's showing again just how violent Spanish influenza was. Um, 
Another big part that was is that the newspaper would comment on people, relatives, who were outside of Pullman but had either died because they'd received word of people who lived in the city or lived in the uh, county that actually their relatives had passed away and they would submit that story to the newspaper who would then comment on it. For example, uh, Miss Liz Os Osbury, um, who was actually a graduate of Washington State College and had at the time moved with her husband to Olympia. Next slide, please. So starting in October or November, I apologize again, um, that's when the situation actually, even though it says it starts to improve, really just kind of mellowed and then it would come and pick back up. So 37 dead, but again, what the newspaper would do in the hopes to not frighten everybody is they wouldn't count a total count. They would do the most recent count. So that again was put, in, put on top of the already previous number, bringing it up much higher. So also this was a very interesting story and it was the death of a nurse fighting influenza. So Miss Mary P. Packingham um, had actually served with the SATC, which was the Student Army Training Corps, on campus where the soldiers had been taken because the entire campus was actually converted into a medical facility in the hopes that they would have housing uh, to place all the soldiers. For example, the gymnasium was converted to be a, a field, well, an emergency hospital. Many of the fraternities and sororities, their houses were actually commandeered by the military so that they would have space to place injured and uh, weakened soldiers. And they had requested nurses from the surrounding area, be it uh, Colfax, uh, doctors from within Pullman and other individuals who actually had medical experience to be there to help fight influenza but often what that would do is that would expose them to the very disease that they're trying to combat. So this is also another very interesting one is that they actually had posted in the newspaper the death of a professor at the Washington State College which obviously was very important to me because it shows a direct connection not just to the soldiers that came into the city but to the college itself. Next slide, please. So going into November again, or later a little bit of November, they started to comment more on different deaths. Uh, for example, this was a very interesting one. Churches emptying quicker just as, uh, sorry, beds emptying just as quickly as they're filling. That's not because the people are getting better, sadly. Um, so this is the dread of every college student. The college, even though they had an epidemic, they did not stop classwork. <laughs> Next slide, please. So, at the time, the newspaper again was trying to hope to combat, uh, combat this idea of hysteria, where people were going to be in such terror of Spanish influenza because of what it had been doing to the country and what it was doing to them locally, that they actually started to post ads that were saying, we have the flu under control, we don't have to worry about it, there was nothing in the last 48 hours, even though often they wasn't entirely truthful. So, and this is another thing that actually went against the county and the state health officer, so when the armistice was actually announced or when they had first been initiated and Pullman received the news, they immediately broke out of their quarantine and threw a parade. So you now had roughly 5,000 individuals, about a quarter of which were infected with Spanish influenza, all surrounding themselves with each other. So again, not exactly the most hygienic uh, idea to throw out there. So we also had um, the state or another health official come down into Pullman who did quote that it was starting to uh, get a little better. Next slide, please. So going into the middle of November, they lifted their ban once more with the quarantine. So this is the actual official lift of their first quarantine for a few days. And then the most of this is Influence is slowly dying down, you know, they, they have a few spatterings of individuals who had passed away, but the school had reopened, the city had reopened, that now meant that everyone could go out, the soldiers could come back off campus, and it made it so that they actually could spread them out in the population again. Next slide, please. So what that actually concluded was the second wave of Spanish influenza, because the first wave was actually, quote, in May, when you had that few spatterings of pneumonia, and then that wave from the beginning of October to the middle of November is the second wave, and it extends a little bit into December, but at the start of January is when you get hit with the third one. So, not yet. So, um, for example, soldiers are very happy that the ban is lifted. They don't really have a lot to do on campus, 
So they're happy that the ban is lifted and that they actually ha were able to go out and um, have a little fun. This is a very interesting story about a man and uh, his wife who actually traveled into Idaho to take care of a family who had all six of them had fallen ill. So they had no one to take care of each other. The only way to really get better if you had fallen sick with pneumonia was to have near constant care. Someone constantly feeding you fluids and someone constantly making sure that you actually weren't just... I, I don't really have a good word for that. I apologize. <laughs> um, so going on, um, you have November 29th saying the flu is almost over. And you have, uh, because of the end of the war, the Student Army Training Corps to be disbanded. So the military is now officially saying they're going to pull out of Pullman and hopefully take all of their people with them. <coughs> Next slide, please. So here we have a small uh, inkling of what the actual thing was. So the really interesting thing is that I said 45 deaths here. That was only for October. It didn't actually include November's numbers, so that I apologize for that. Um, you had roughly at the time 5,000 individuals. You had a rough um, 800 cases. And then of those 800 cases, you actually had around 100 people who had passed away. So next slide, please. So going into December, you start at the start of December, you had only a little bit of influenza still hanging on. At the time, the disease had still been uh, within the population. It was still affecting everyone. And you've just started to realize that it wasn't going to be that big of an issue is what people were hoping. So you had a few. You had one death, two deaths. And you also had the mayor getting asked to send his nurses to three other cities. For example, I'm not going to be able to pronounce that right, but Tico. Tico, Tico thank you very much. Tico had asked for um, nurses and doctors from Pullman to be able to come into their city to hopefully take care of their uh, sick. Next slide, please. Ah, yes. So... <laughs> With the issue of the fact that influenza was now starting to pick up again in the last week because they had roughly a couple more um, deaths, the city slammed the quarantine down. They're like, we have one, we're not going to have any more. So they immediately reinstituted the quarantine and nothing happened. There was no injuries, no sickness, no, uh, or anything of the line. And at the church's behest, they lifted the quarantine on December 27th. Um, so it was actually a very important note, thing to note that the church is the one who influenced the city and the college to lift their ban in the hopes that they could get people out about and really mingling in a way of healing from the, uh, from the trauma that it brought on. Next slide, please. Going into January, you have more cases of influenza, but people surviving it now. So the actual mainstream of the A uh, A1 had taken most of its victims, and now it was commenting on stories of people who were surviving the influenza and actually getting better from it. Next slide, please. So, but that also means it's the start of the third wave, because you're still having people who are getting infected, it, uh, infected by it. For example, some of the repercussions of such things are basketball, which sports has always been a big part of American society, Basketball was going to be played behind closed doors. They weren't going to cancel it, but they were going to close. Or they were going to play it where no one could watch, in the hopes that they didn't actually bring anyone out. So again, they got news that influenza was starting to sweep the county again, and they immediately placed in the third ban at the same time as the third wave. So with that, people were getting sick, but they were getting taken care of now. They're, enough doctors had returned from the front. Enough nurses had returned that people were actually getting proper medical care and there was less uh, influenza that was actually on the point of taking lives. Though, as another note to the hysteria factor, um, a minister who was uh, favoring a family service said, we don't really have any way of really combating influenza, so turn to God. Which had been just showing the prevalent mood of what influenza had done on the society. Next slide, please. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually, I thought it was interesting to include, but this had been uh, in the paper for pretty much since October, um, which I just, I got a laugh out of, so I hope, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, with this, the Red Cross had not actually been closed down with the end of the war. Because influenza was still happening rapidly throughout the country, the Red Cross had been asked to continue providing medical supplies and volunteers in the hopes that they would actually be, have more people to combat uh, influenza in the major cities. At this time, a very interesting news article came out about the United States military at campus. Uh, the SATC, which was commanded by a man called Lewis, uh, Colonel Lewis, 
have been investigated for a negligent death of a man's son, Mr. Sanborn, who they said it was a dereliction of duty charge because they did not do everything within their power to save his son's life. At the time, though, this had already been taking place for roughly a few months because the investigation had been instituted in November, but it was only commented in January. I'm sorry, I'm going a little long. I apologize. Um, so it had only been instituted in January, uh, shown in January, but it was, came out to be very interesting because it showed that people had actually developed a slight distrust in the military. They had recognized some of the things that it had brought with them, and so they wanted to see how it would go. The investigation concluded that there was no dereliction of duty charge. It was just a series of unfortunate events. Next slide, please. So, um, coming back into closing in January, they included a story from E.M. Uh, e. Hayes, who was serving on a ship down in South America for the United States Navy, and how he commented that nearly half of his shipmates had died from influenza or been infected by it. Now, the ship was roughly a destroyer size, and a destroyer holds around five, 500 people at the time. So it was a very large number, especially in a condensed area. Next slide, please. So this is when the third ban had been lifted. So they lifted it right as the third wave was supposedly leaving the area, and that pretty much concludes the effects of influenza within, within Pullman. So what it had, it had come with the military, it had infected the population at large, but it didn't really, the newspaper had very little to comment on the people of Pullman. There was the occasional uh, death mentioned or the occasional sickness, but what it really had focused on was the military itself. Most of the casualty counts were the casualty counts that were displayed by the military. Um, and you'll see on some of my uh, posters, you'll actually, there was comments between the military and the head of the college, Dr. Holland. Next slide, please. So going into February, you have the official removal of the ban, uh, a few spatterings of deaths, but this one I do not believe was caused by influenza, and deaths uh, in locations that were outside of Pullman. Next slide, please. So now you're again starting to uh, get more comments, but nothing within Pullman of areas such as Wenatchee or Walla Walla, of people who were related to individuals in Pullman or the college or had been alumni. Next slide, please. And then this is the actual last comment that the paper had on the deaths of individuals from Spanish influenza, and that happened in March 14th in Spokane. Next slide, please. So at this time, that's when um, April was the official concluding of where we had actually stopped with our research because the three waves had been passed through, there was no more, that's when it was commonly accepted by the scholars, having done their research that influenza had passed. And so April was when little things that were didn't have much to do with the uh, disease, but were still important to note, such as the Pullman Herald, which was my primary source, being converted into the Pullman Tribune, uh, the people of the United States donating clothes and other articles for relief efforts in uh, France and Germany. And then uh, April 25th, they listed a man who died, but I believe it was of old age. They didn't really list it quite well. So in conclusion, what happens is the paper had commented majority on the deaths of soldiers because that was who had played the largest role, as you can see. And then what the one thing that was very important to take away is that quarantines actually proved effective. What the quarantines did is they dramatically limited the spread of influenza throughout the surrounding area. And since influenza was a viral disease and it was so brutal in the sense that many of its individuals who came down with it were actually killed by it, it didn't spread quickly if it didn't have much people to, uh, to be around. So, and then I found this is a very interesting um, graphic, is it showed the massive <coughs> spike that happened in October and November uh, throughout uh, America and Europe. So that actually concludes my presentation. Is there any questions you guys would like to ask that before she gets started? Yes. You probably covered this, and I may have missed it. Where, where's the Spanish from in Spanish? Oh, uh, yes, actually, thank you very much. So the reason that it was called Spanish influenza was because at the time it was first discovered by a Spanish doctor or first recognized in Spain, where it was then uh, commented on. And because that was where it was officially recognized or uh, thought of, they attributed it to him being from that area. So any other questions? How many military on campus actually died? Um, so the total number of military that died from the uh, from it 
on campus at the end of November, because they officially pulled out at that time, was 45, I believe. Um, so that were direct casualties from it. And they had a total number of around 800 cases. If not, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. You. <clears throat> Nicole will come up. Uh, I'll just kind of remind you. <clears throat> The students' uh, assignments involved, uh, of course, the paper that I described to you. Uh, all of them were required to come up with a uh, poster, and, uh, and then all of their research finally went into the PowerPoint. So in a sense, <clears throat> the class had, in a sense, three deliverables, and uh, both of them lend themselves very well to a, a presentation, so I kind of browbeat them into it. So, <laughs> so the, the paper, the poster, the PowerPoints, that's, that's, the, that's, that's kind of the, the background, which might make more sense to you now. So Nicole is going to talk to you next about uh, uh, Colfax, and as I said, you're going to you see some real clear connections between Pullman and Colfax. So mine's probably going to be a little bit shorter. He covered most of the Spanish influenza background information. I think you guys understand that well enough at this point. Um, I did Colfax, uh, Washington, which we all know Colfax. Um, I focused my main primary source was the Colfax Gazette, which is now the Whitman County Gazette. They have absorbed them in the 40s, I believe. Um, big shocker. <laughs> I'm sure we all know where, they, where Colfax is. Um, this is an overhead view of Colfax. Um, in 1918, 1919, the population was roughly 2,700 to 3,000. There's no census from those exact dates, but it's roughly the size we it is today. But that is only the city of Colfax, not the rural farms around it, or the um, the close, like, smaller cities, or towns, I guess would be better. Next. Um, this is St. Ignatius Hospital. Um, it was the only hospital in between Spokane and Lewiston. So, basically, that whole stretch was the, they all had to come to St. Ignatius to get any sort of medical treatment. Um, except for smaller in-home doctors. And there was an infirmary in Pullman, but during the war, when the, um, when the epidemic first broke out, it actually was monopolized by the military and civilians had to come to St. Ignatius to get any medical treatment. So there was a lot of travel in and out of Pullman, or Col Colfax because of that, which helped spread disease. Um, in January, so Pullman was a mess during the epidemic, right? <laughs> Colfax was a mess before the epidemic. Um, there was grip and pneumonia and measles and all sorts of outbreaks constantly in the year leading up to the epidemic. Um, there was a lot of pneumonia. There was one surgery before the epidemic where a man had to get the pus drained out of his lungs from pneumonia. And this wasn't even pneumonia following Spanish influenza. It was just a regular, regular strain of, of pneumonia. Um, there were also a few deaths, but like, it's kind of amazing. All the deaths that happened in the first few months were like Colfax pioneers who came, who were like 86 years old, which is a good ripe old age for today in 1918. It's remarkable that a bunch of people were able to live till 86. There were like, I think a dozen people in their eighties who died at this, at, in this time. And there was also an outbreak of chickenpox, tonsillitis, bronchitis, and grip, in, especially in school children a lot, but also in the general population. Um, my second main primary source was a Dr. Robert Scape, who was a doctor in Colfax. He um, kept a daily journal for like three decades. And in 1918, he did a lot on the um, epidemic at the time. In January, on January 21st, he actually went to a, um, a conference by Dr. Holland, president of Washington State College, and influenza was actually discussed. Not Spanish influenza, because this was still January and Spanish influenza was not a thing yet, but um, they were aware of influenza. Again, they didn't know 
about viral infections. They were also discussing bacteriology. So they thought influenza was a bacteria that will come back to haunt them later. Um, and there was also a tuberculosis nurse, Miss May King, who she came a few times throughout the year. She would come, she would educate doctors and the general public on what to do about sickness because they did have a big sickness problem um, during be, or before the epidemic and then she'd come back during the epidemic a couple of times. Um, April through June, pretty much the same. There was a ton of pneumonia. There was a lot of grip, which again is basically the flu basically the flu. Um, <laughs> it's complicated. There's a thing later where they're getting the flu confused with grip and it's, it's a whole big deal. Um, and one person was actually quarantined because of measles in his home. They were very familiar with quarantines. They recognized their value in preventing epidemics or, or outbreaks. Um, so they, they were not hesitant to use quarantine throughout the year. Um, in July, there was another 87-year-old man who died. There was also an um, article about the Army Medical Department declaring war on flies and mosquitoes, where they're educating the public about how flies and mosquitoes can spread disease and they can just be generally unhealthy, um, which, whether or not it's valid, it is showing how they're dedicated to making sure the public understands this is an issue. Um, and this is one of a Colfax resident, resident who went to Camp Lewis um, in, on the west side, um, who wrote home and it was published in the newspaper about his, what, what, what was happening to him while he was deployed. Um, he, he told a story about how he was shot but not wounded, which is, he's talking about vaccines. So he, he got a shot, but he wasn't wounded. So there, they're promoting this idea of vaccines being good, and that's systematic throughout the year ahead of time. Yeah. Um, also in July, it is worth mentioning, there are two major doctors, Dr. Palamountain, who was, um, he was a surgeon. There was a lot of surgeries performed in Colfax, a lot of surgeries, um, both routine and necessary and elective. Um, and then there was Dr. Scape, who had his journals. He was county health officer. He was, um, he did home calls. He did a lot of community outreach and he was an anesthesiologist. So he would mention like going and performing anesthesia for Dr. Palamountain's um, surgeries a lot in his diaries. Um, but both of them in July went to um, Camp Lewis to do like a big general um, health checkup for a bunch of the soldiers. So Dr. Scape talked about how it was like this big room and the soldiers would come up one by one and the doctor would check them out real quick and then move along as quick as possible, mm -hmm. which being around a bunch of soldiers, as Dustin mentioned, not a good idea at this time. Um, August through September is what I call tonsil season. <laughs> so as we know, to the tonsils are believed to be a sort of filter for debris and infectors and um, the adenoids, which they also liked to remove, secrete white blood cells, which helps fight infections. And tonsillitis is a major problem for some people. I've had it, y'all have probably had it. It can suck. Recurrent tonsillitis can be a problem and a lot of people would get them removed to prevent that. Still due to, to, to this, still do to this day to some extent, but today we kind of aren't sure whether it's a good thing or whether it actually weakens our immune system. So having so many, mostly children, um, taking their tonsils out probably wasn't a very good thing in the end. Yep. This is tonsillectomies just reported, not even all of them that happened, just that were reported in the newspaper. In August, there were 19, and again, this is just Colfax residents, not including any people who came from Pullman or anywhere else to get their tonsils removed. It's crazy how many there were. Um, I think that they're getting them all done in August so they can heal up before they go to school, where um, having you know, a bunch of kids running around, sickness, ugh. 
Um, in October is when the first wave hit. It didn't hit quite as early as Pullman. They did know that a lot of people were, you know, um, getting sick in Pullman, but they were reluctant to admit that it was Spanish influenza at first. They were aware of Spanish influenza, but they attributed most things to typhoid fever and um, uh, tuberculosis, so because testing wasn't the same as it was today. Um, but on the 18th, the first case was reported, and the next week, Miss Hannah, who was a um, a like young mother wife in I think her 30s, died, was the first person to die of Spanish influenza or to be reported as dead of Spanish influenza. Um, but Dr. Scape was very aware that it was spreading, spreading rapidly as soon as they admitted to themselves what was happening. Yep. Um, and they were so quick in imposing a quarantine. As soon as they realized what was happening, they shut the entire town down. They um, shut down schools, churches. They even shut down the courts. So there was no, like, law system at that point, which is really interesting. Um, the Whitman County Historical Society has oral histories online, and a handful of them talk about this era or this time. And one woman, I cannot remember her name right now, um, said that there was a rule where there could only be three people in one spot at a time. So four people, you're out, you're done, you know? It was pretty pretty crazy, and it went for a long time. Um, but it did start with them just calling off a fair, and then the next three days, I believe, they shut the entire town down. Um, this is a image that was in a lot of the Washington newspapers at the time um, that was explaining how coughs and sneezes spread diseases, and they're as dangerous as poison gas shells, which isn't all that unrealistic if we're thinking about numbers. Um, in November, again, people were dying. The first four people to die of Spanish influenza were women. They kind of made a big deal about that in the newspaper. Don't know why. People are weird. <laughs> um, but there was quite a few people um, suffering from influenza and the flu and pneumonia. But there was a woman who was convinced she didn't have the flu, she just had grip, which is the flu. So there was misdiagnosis and there was confusion. And it was, it really hurt in the long run because they would misdiagnose other things and think that quarantines could be lifted when they shouldn't have been and then the epidemic would just rage on. Thank you. Um, again. They tried to lift the quarantine in November. It lasted about two weeks, and then they shut it down again in the beginning of December. They were convinced that the flu had subsided, um, and it was getting better. Uh, Dr. Benson, who was the city health officer, so just for, for Colfax instead of Whitman County, um, said that there had been 170 cases since October 18th basically, which is when they first started acknowledging the presence in the town. Um, but a great percent of them have recovered. Also in November, there was Miss May King again, the tuberculosis nurse. She came and she educated the public on how to not get sick. Um, another nurse came and she sacrificed her life by um, one of the women who had died the month prior, she was nursing her and she caught influenza and died of pneumonia. Um, another doctor from uh, St. Ignatius had the flu um, and nine of the girls in training for to be nurses ended up getting influenza, which Colfax was a very patriotic town. They were very big on, we can send more than we need to to the war effort. We can send more women, more nurses, and we, they were also very big on sending them to Pullman, who they also knew needed help because they were also very military oriented. And that was a, a big major like 
issue in the town was that they were falling ill and they couldn't go do that anymore. In December, there was, they're at the point where even though it's a pretty small town, they're not, they're not um, publishing individual deaths anymore. They're lumping them into big, uh, big articles. There was one farmer who they made a big deal out of him because he was like a 250 pounds, so he was obese for 1918 when, when um, obesity was not a big thing. And they were saying how it weakened his constitution and it was his fault for dying. And it was all a very big, <laughs> weird, weird thing. Um, <laughs> there was also more influenza and pneumonia. And that this is another uh, uh, cartoon about use a handkerchief and do your bit to protect me. So there again, Covering your cough does not help, or it doesn't prevent it, but it helps. Um, but they're explaining how things spread that way, and it was oriented towards children as well, because they, they knew that the population of children were really big on spreading diseases, because a lot of the outbreaks before this were in schools. This is the deaths reported by age. So again, it mostly targeted people who were young and healthy. There were a few people who were very young who did die from it. And there were very, a few people who died um, from not from influenza during this time, who were most of them old age because they were in their 80s. So uh, this is a weird one. It's they monetized losses from the war versus influenza, where they were saying, since we entered the war in 1917, we have spent 500K roughly on the war effort. And I'm not sure where they're getting these numbers from. And then in the 23 days since influenza struck, they um, have spent 600K on, or they've lost 600K. And they knew that the worst is yet to come. They knew that it's not yet flu season. We're going to be hit bad later this year. And then again, at the end of December, they're convinced that the flu situation is improving. They um, are trying to get the, the quarantine lifted. At this point, it had been like three and a half months that they've been in quarantine and they tried to lift it and then it spread far and wide again so they put it back on and then at the very end of the month they decided hey we're gonna lift it again on January 5th um, but Dr. Scaife even it wasn't just for the public he was convinced that the epi epidemic was subsiding and he wanted to open services soon um, again they lifted the ban on January 5th that lasted another two weeks they only opened schools and churches and courts. Everything else still remained closed. They didn't want to risk theaters and dances and anything like that. Um, but they did get a new army surgeon after the war. He came to Colfax to uh, St. Ignatius. Um, but they were very aware that the flu situation was getting worse. And January is the worst month for Colfax. They tried to open schools, they did open schools, and then they closed them almost immediately because there was such low attendance rates that they didn't think it was worth trying to educate a handful of students. And they decided that they were going to um, increase the school day to like something like 12 hours by the end of this. And then they were going into like July. It was crazy how they were trying to make up all these months they were losing. And they also implemented a thing for children that was a health crusade where every day kids had to wash their hands and uh, wash food before they ate it and brush off their shoes and get enough sleep and open windows for fresh air, thinking, rightly so, that that will help prevent disease. And it was like this new thing that definitely would help in the long run with preventing outbreaks. There was several young people. There was one mother who was caring for her children and died on the way to the hospital 
Um, she was from like a rural farm on the outskirts of Colfax. And then there was another one who was 19 years old and um, her husband died like the week prior. These are illnesses. So um, it peaked in January. Influenza and pneumonia peaked. They had forgotten the gra about grip at this point. They re recognized that th it grip was the flu, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> and deaths. So. I separated them out, influenza versus pneumonia, because they seem to be sure that influenza would cause death in itself, even though uh, our secondary sources, are the researchers, said that almost all deaths actually did occur from pneumonia instead of influenza. It was complications of influenza. But um, they peaked in January and December. Um, in February, they tried to open schools again, and they didn't open because they were worried about the epidemic. Um, there was more people getting sick of pneumonia and influenza. Yeah, sorry. Um, and then they were certain that the city was completely free of influenza. There was other surrounding cities, they mentioned Endicott once, that was riddled with influenza. Um, but there was not a single case of influenza in the city, and Dr. Scaife was convinced the flu has blown out in Colfax. So they were pretty confident that they were in the clear at this point. Again, there was only one house now quarantined, and they lifted the general quarantine, so there could be more than three people out on the streets, but this ha house couldn't leave. They hadn't opened things like... Um, like uh, schools or, or theaters yet, though. Um, and this is the wind down. Everything's good at this point. You know, it was, it was gone. There was one man who did die of influenza, but everything else was the, the sisters of St. Ignatius, the nuns who did staff the hospital. They sent out a big thank you for the money and the help that they were given during the epidemic. And they had a big dance for returned soldiers. They weren't afraid to host big groups of people anymore in March. And yeah, that's the end. At the end of the epidemic, the um, count or the city health officer, Dr. Benson, said that there was a total of 421 cases throughout the epidemic, which is 25% of the Colfax population were infected with the disease, but only. 0.7% of the population did die of the disease, and the national um, statistic is 2.5%. So their measures did work. They were a mess before the epidemic, and they knew how to compensate for that because they had so much experience with disease. Yeah, that's it. Any questions? join me up here, Dustin. One of the things that uh, became pretty obvious <clears throat> in this course to, to, to all of us, uh, there were like uh, maybe 12 students in the class, and um, <clears throat> I'm trying to turn my timer off here so I don't interrupt myself. Um, one of the things that, uh, uh, well, several things, the confusion, the fits and starts that, uh, that became evident. Uh, we'd have people from Wenatchee and Spokane and, and uh, uh, Okanagan and <clears throat> just all over the state. And, and uh, there, there wasn't a unified approach to all this. Each one had its own little story that comes along and, and just jars you. Uh, many times we'd, uh, we'd hear about someone reporting that uh, Mrs. Smith was fine in the morning and she died at 5 o'clock tonight. I mean, what, what, I mean, Really? I mean, you're, you're fine at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning and you're dead at 5 o'clock at night? Now, there weren't all kinds of them like that, but there were reports like that. And there, there was times I just looked at all this and you know, read the papers and, and we had all, all kinds of good uh, secondary sources and we had uh, documentaries. 
And uh, the other thing that kind of struck me was how quickly people tended to forget. You know, for the longest time, we just didn't think about the uh, flu of 1918, 1919. We kind of forgot about it. Uh, the 1920s, it was, I mean, you know, once it was over with and it didn't come back, people were content not to really talk about it. And only recently, well, I say recently for an historian, that's, you know, that, that's, that means something different perhaps. But you see large numbers of scholars kind of, you know, catching on and, and catching up to the flu. Uh, because it, 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 we, we like to see it as aberrant, we like to see it as something that wasn't going to come back. And, um, um, and I think there was this, because you know, even in some of the towns you'd see these denials. They put the quarantine back on, but then everything's fine. Then put the quarantine back on, well, everything is fine. Uh, I, I didn't understand it, you know, because you know, we'd see it and, and, and the students watched the same thing, where it was this kind of fits and starts, and, and was it denial? I don't know what it was exactly. And in terms of trying to figure out what was going on, you know, did they get pneumonia? Uh, did they get the flu? Uh, what, did they, what did they die from? Did the, the flu weaken them so that they died from pneumonia? Uh, were doctors confused where they were misdiagnosing things? Uh, it, it, it was fascinating. And, and I always tell students that if you come out of, a, uh, out of your study and, and you're, uh, uh, you have a, a bit of an understanding, but there's more confusion, that's probably means that you did a good job with your research. Um, a question that you might have of them? Uh, do we, yes, Teresa? So the death rate was higher in Pullman than Colfax, is that correct? Yes, Pullman had a higher concentration of people within condensed groups, such as the soldiers being contained to the area of the campus. Now that's roughly almost 2,000 people in, on campus in what is now smaller than the area that we have currently. And that also at the time meant that there was uh, less medical care in the area because they didn't have the access to the hospital and a lot of their, there you go. <laughs> sorry, um, and a lot of their uh, soldiers weren't receiving the medical care that was hopefully that they could receive in other locations. So it'd be a two prong because, the, because Colfax had the hospital. Yes, and that's the numbers that I give are solely for Colfax residents, not for the people who use the hospital. If I did that, it would be like a 400 page paper. So, uh, so. <laughs> another thing about that actually is that the only reason I have majority of my postings of casualties as soldiers is because we found out like 90% of the way through that all of the people in Pullman that were getting ill were actually going to Colfax. And it wasn't being reported in the Colfax paper? And it wasn't being reported either in, in, or in, in the Pullman Herald. And that's because if you want to look at our display on healthcare in the early 20th century over here, <laughs> there, there is a hospital in Pullman in this time period. Um, it's um, Beesler's Sanatorium. It's Kimball Funeral Home now. It's been only functioning for seven years. Pullman did not have consistent hospital care for its residents or people around. And when this flu hit on WC, uh, they had a seven bed infirmary called Maple Cottage. That's all they had. And then this private health care, fancy, nice, but probably unaffordable for most people. So most Pullman people and even, even Fort and Union County people used St. Ignatius. So they had to because even if it had been larger at WSU, it wasn't open for them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when they built Finch Memorial Hospital in 1948, it was only for WSC and affiliated students and faculty. The, the local residents could not use it. Thank you very much. The history is really interesting. So we just put up this display. <laughs> oh, know. So take a look at it. Do I understand you correctly that most of the uh, victims? were young, healthy. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so uh, another another part of the reason that uh, it affected the military so dramatically is the military is a concentration of mili what we consider military age males, which is now 18 to 45? 35. 30, I don't know what's going on. 18 to 35, so it's, it's the healthiest age group for males normally within the United States and generally in the human population, those who are the strongest, most physically fit. Um, so since that's such a concentration, that would be that was one of the critical reasons why there's also a much higher casualty rate in Pullman is because there was that age group that the disease was actually targeting. Yeah, and I think too, uh, you know, we think of flu as affecting you know you know children, little, little kids, and the elderly. 
and that's true. Uh, but H1N1 was different, and I, I think that adds to the confusion because you know, what what the, the the best and the, the healthiest and the strongest are dying. I think it really left people you know uh, in a uncertain state. Like, you know, is this really the flu? Because normally the flu is hits different people, and I think that by going after this, uh, and I think both of them did a really good job of conveying that that it, it hit people in you know kind of the prime of their lives, you know, which which is fairly unusual. Not some cold facts. The flu is people who died by age. Uh, I have two quick questions. Yeah. Well, one comment and one question. First of all, I, my perception is that it was much worse in the mid Midwest and, and back east, the flu, mm -hmm. and the death rates and so forth, possibly because they moved in larger towns closer together, but I'm not sure about that. But we have friends whose father um, lived through the flu epidemic and his school was closed down for three months. That quarantine. And when he, he was in the second grade, I think, and when he went back to school, half of his classmates had died. Mm -hmm. And so the emotional toll that all this death takes needs to be considered as well. What did that do to an eight-year-old kid or a 10-year-old kid who half his classmates in one fell swoop? That's really... Yeah. And the second <coughs> question I have, this is a question. I read the flu book by Gina, is it Colada? Colada? Mm -hmm. several years ago, and it seems to me, and I can't remember, but you guys have read it more recently, and I just want this answer. Didn't she link Spanish flu? Haven't they decided that was swine flu now? Um, is that correct? <coughs> it's been about five years, probably, since I read it. Uh, so, yeah, so we actually did a study in class that was showing the kind of decade spanning between minor epidemics and then Spanish influenza starting from 1890 where there was roughly every 10 years would be another strain of flu that would come through and sweep through the population. Uh, in the 1960s, that's when the, or 1960s or 1970s, the actual swine flu as we know it came through, correct? Well, at that time, they actually went back to that and they researched it and they found out that that was just a later strain of Spanish influenza and which was one of the reasons I actually included in my slides the uh, the transferable transferability of disease from pigs to humans, okay. uh, even though it wasn't a disease that was related to Spanish influenza. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to follow up from Kathy's comment, my uncle who lived in Omaha, Nebraska, was 18 years old when the entire family had flu except for him, and his response to that was that he was not going to get it so he took off and went to Seattle <laughs> lived there the rest of his life because he loved it so but I mean to be 18 and leave your family yeah. and to go across the country yeah. because you were out of, out of, fearful out of, fear. of the consequences mm -hmm. of the flu yeah yeah <clears throat> wow. yeah you know, the, the, the point uh, that uh, Dustin made, too, about virgin soil epidemics with uh, uh, Al Crosby is a really is a really useful one. Uh, we talk about what's really uh, worthwhile, and the epidemics are, or excuse me, the quarantines are, are clearly very helpful. Um, but uh, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, that, that virgin flu, or the, the virgin soil epidemic, just the slightest care, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, can, can make such a difference. Um, and because my background in the American Indian history, we talk about virgin soil epidemics. And the problem then is that these would hit all at once. And when I would say, you know, everyone's sick at once, you know, you know I, I asked the question, when you get sick, you know, I had, I had kids that had uh, chicken pox. Uh, Molly got them at uh, about three years old and she kind of got a little pink faced and I didn't know what that was. Oh, chicken pox. Then Chris, the older one, uh, got a, a really bad case. He still has scars. He's one of those guys that can't let a, a, a scab go unpicked. And then his oldest bo uh, brother uh, uh, just was wretched. Just, you know, when, when he was better and we sent him back to school, the teacher sent him home, even though the doctor said that he's fine. And I talk about that because it was about a three week jump, you know. And so each time you can just devote all kinds of care to someone. What happens when you get sick all at once? Everything goes to hell on you. I mean, something as simple as getting water to where you don't have a, you can keep your temperature out or you don't die of dehydration. Such little teeny things like that are important. And I think too, when 
uh, you know, they mentioned that several times where a whole family would be sick at once. Now that's, you know, that's supposed to happen with American Indians and smallpox. And the minute I saw that, my first thought was, you know, this is, this is a flu version of uh, virgin soil epidemics. And, um, uh, <clears throat> and maybe that uh, lends itself too to the, uh, what I call confusion, uh, the inability to really kind of confront this. I think it just sort of went past people's ability. It's like, you know, we get the flu, but usually it's the kids, usually it's the, the, the elderly. Now it's 18 and you can be healthy in the morning and dead at five o'clock at night. What's that do to, I mean, it kind of goes back to your, popular, you know, your, your comment about the little kid that had half the class gone. It's really, a, you know, it's, it's more than just a medical emergency. It, it's, it's a social um, uh, 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 dislocation in your life. Well, and the same was true during the bubonic plague. That's exactly what was going sure. on. Sure, exactly. yeah, because absolutely. You could, you could be fine. Yeah. It, six hours later, you'd yeah. be dead. Yeah. But on and the, there was, oh, go ahead. Okay. Just tremendous religious questioning. Yeah. People's faith was shaken in not just God, but everything they knew. You know, it was, and there was a higher death rate among the, the priests and nuns who were trying to help people. And it, it's punishment from God. Well, Why are the yeah. priests and nuns dying? It was just a calamitous, it had a calamitous effect on social mores and, and people's thoughts. And it was, it was. Really with, with, and with, I think with, this was true of yeah. many places. With Crosby, he talks really about true. with certain tribes when they'd be hit by the smallpox, they commit suicide. Yeah. Yeah. When all of a sudden a village would be hit, they they when they realized what had happened, they'd jump off a cliff. Mm -hmm. They they'd kill themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of my bizarre questions. Because thinking about the Black Death and and when you have so many people dying. And the town, you only have so many morticians, you only have so many funeral parlors, you only have so many these big graves and the rest of that. Did you see any any inkling, any mention of that in the reading that you were doing, newspapers, any, it, it's, I'm always curious about how are we handling all the corpses? <laughs> Actually, in Colfax, there was a lot of Christian scientists who had come, mm -hmm. which, who doesn't know, Christian scientists believe that medical medicine is irrelevant and the only medicine you need is God basically and they would come and they would do lectures like once or twice a month or every one or two months um, to try to get people on their side and stop um, going and using medicine but it was weird because I would I would have assumed that Colfax would be a very religious town um, but they actually devoted everything to medicine and they were very very into the medicine aspect of it uh, for Poland, they actually had no mentioning of what they were doing with their uh, influenza victims. They didn't mention where they were going, what they were doing, how they were being taken care of by the mortician or anything like that. But as I was reading about that, we actually had very interesting videos and documentaries. We looked about cities that were hit very hard on the East Coast and how that would completely overload their uh, morticians. They're uh, everywhere from their morgues to their incinerators for those who wanted to their cemeteries. So they ran out of space to start having and carrying these people, which again would lead to them in very morbid cases, leaving people on the sidewalk to be picked up in the morning, yeah. which brought to mind Monty Python and the Holy Grail. That's a true love. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in Colfax, there are only 23 deaths. So mortician, that wasn't as much of an issue. But um, Bruning, who was the funeral director, he did get sick like three times over the course of the, of the epidemic, once from bronchitis, once from the flu, and then he had a follow-up flu. Um, and so there were issues when they died and he couldn't take care of them, but he would get to them eventually. You know, so it was, <laughs> it was like they were there, they were in the funeral home, but they had to wait. <laughs> you need them about ice because in those yeah. days, yeah, yeah. 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 Call yeah. Ice. My <clears throat> my wife owns the uh, Cliff House on Maiden Lane. Uh, one of the it's a like a twelve unit apartment, and she tells the story that uh, when they bought the building, uh, it, uh, they they learned that uh, <clears throat> the attic. Uh, was used as a uh, storage place for corpses oh, no. in Pullman. And I told her she shouldn't tell that story because <laughs> she, she's still renting the building. <laughs> but, but she's very quick to, you know, uh, 
that was because the attic was unfinished and it, it was a place it was it's a large building mm -hmm. and it was gold whether that's true or not <laughs> yeah 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 I'm not sure it's true but uh, perhaps <laughs> once you had the Spanish flu I, I thought I heard you say a second case could you get it again yeah. <clears throat> you don't I don't think you catch it again but I think your immune system like you have a relapse basically so to my understanding, what was actually happening is that they would get the Spanish influenza and then they would be weakened in their immune system. They would at the almost exact same time catch pneumonia, yeah, at was... which point they would either uh, succumb to it or survive it. And then they could go for a week, two weeks where their immune system is still in that weakened state and then they could relapse and get pneumonia again. So that's for most of those cases where they say someone has come down with it multiple times it was that whole idea of misdiagnosis where they didn't have enough people to fully understand or enough information to fully understand were they actually coming down with spanish flu or pneumonia because they were so closely linked most people assumed that they were the same thing yeah. what did you two enjoy most about doing this project stepping back in time 100 years ago um, as young people oh, like you are. It was not going through the microfiche. <laughs> <laughs> that was by far the worst part. For three months of staring at a computer screen. I like, I, I found uh, Dr. Scape's diaries in mask, and I was really excited when I found those, because it was like actually going through a real book and like seeing him in his the cursive and the, you know, my generation cursive, not a thing. <laughs> Uh, for me specifically, was since I'm so, my area of focus for history is actually military studies, uh, it was the understanding of letters and things that were documented between the SATC or the Student Army Training Corps and its development into the Army ROTC program, which I'm a now part of, and as well as the fact that um, it, they were comment there was comments in the investigation and there was a lot of letters going back and forth between uh, the Colonel Lewis and uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Holland, who was the president of the WS, uh, WSC. Mm -hmm. So I found that extremely interesting and mm -hmm. the whole idea of how the military was so critical in being the <laughs> issue that actually caused, in quote, the spread of Spanish influenza. Mm -hmm. You can almost attribute it's the spread of the soldiers that was the real cause of this disease because they're the ones that took it to where it developed in the battlefield, brought it back and spread it throughout the country as soldiers were going home. And a lack of resources because they were all abroad fighting yes. the war. So at the same time, you now have a massive lack in doctors, medical supplies, nurses, and able-bodied young men and women to actually be there to work the jobs that were now getting vacant. <laughs> yes? One thing I think, too, that most people, especially in farming communities, did not go to the doctor uh, except to last resort anyway. So that has something to do with, you know, why they wouldn't be taken in until the last second, if they were at all. And a lot of people were buried in their own home grounds, too, so there wouldn't be any use of a mortuary. That's a, a, stuff like that is one of the big reasons why we don't have a definitive number of uh, those who were had cases and or who were actually died from Spanish influenza is because at the time, there was a big part of the population in the United States that was agrarian, and they didn't actually live in cities. So we have massive documentation about how these cities were affected, but we know that rural communities such as Colfax or even the smaller uh, communities around this area that were hit heavily, but we don't know because it just either wasn't documented or it was passed down in word of mouth, which I believe you're, you said your father or grandfather? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got a thing here. I was, yeah, yeah. Is it John? Richard. Richard, Richard. Richard spoke at, uh, with me earlier, and he has a... Um, uh, some um, a, a page or so that he'd like to read from his uh, what's your grandfather? No, this or, was my dad. Your dad. I, my dad was born at Wawawi and moved. By the time he moved back to Whitman County in 1935, he'd lived 23 different places. Mm -hmm. And this was written when he was in Great Falls, Montana. And I'll read the first paragraph just to give it a time frame. Not long after Uncle Dick was killed in the armistice was signed. If I stumble through this, it's in his own handwriting, which is not the best. <laughs> He's buried in France. Grandma got to visit his grave when the government sent the Gold Star Mothers to France in the 20s. During this time, the flu epidemic was getting worse every day. There was no cure the doctors could use. Unlike most epidemics, it didn't seem to select the weak segment of the population, the children and the aged. 
but struck down those in the prime of life. Sometimes those stricken with it died in a few hours. He tells the story about my grandfather riding the bus home from the mine with the guy. And the guy he was sitting next to when he got off the bus said, I don't feel very good. And the next morning, his wife called and said he was dead. <laughs> so very rapidly. It was a respiratory disease, and there were numerous cases where isolated families were found that had all died. There had been a milder form, but of epidemic proportions earlier that spring that had died out. But this time, it hit hard in most parts of the earth all at once. There were cases of isolated Eskimo villages and remote islands that had no contact with the rest of the world that the epidemic hit and nearly wiped out the population. And I'd like to talk to you about that in a little bit. It was worse in the Orient. More soldiers died of it than were killed in World War I. There are statistics that estimate a total of 22 million died. It could have been twice that many. Many areas didn't keep records or, were inac or the records were inaccurate or incomplete. A big percent that supposedly got over the flu died of pneumonia later. Some, like Dad always said, walked around for a year just saving funeral expenses. <laughs> if, if a pregnant woman got it, she was sure to die, so a double tragedy. Mother didn't get the flu, but Dad and I did. Our bouts with it overlapped, so Mother had quite a period of time when she worked at nursing us 24 hours a day. We lived on a street that the hearses used going to the cemetery. These were horse-drawn hearses. You could look out the window almost any time, day or night, and a hearse would be going by. One of the big problems was to get help to dig graves. The ground was frozen a big part of this time, and they didn't have backhoes like we do today. Yeah. So there's two things I actually want to comment on that. One of them is what we learned is that um, when they first actually started researching influenza and the uh, A strain of it in the 1990s and the early 2000s. They actually went to Alaska and went and researched and dug down into the permafrost where victims had been buried to see if they could find a live strain that had been frozen so that they might actually have something that they could do at the time, uh, genetic research, because they now understood uh, medical science much more so that they could back uh, backtrace the genetics of it and actually get an original copy of the uh, A1, H1, uh, A strain of the H1N1 virus. And then the, uh, the second thing I wanted to say is that you always hear of these massive casualties from the Great War. The really interesting part of that is it's not actually from combat. The majority of casualties listed was from Spanish influenza or from other diseases, trench foot, and things that were happening to the soldiers outside of combat. We hear these horrific stories of people getting shelled or being shot, but it's actually, you'll hear these a million people perished in this. Well, it was actually... 700,000 died to a virus or were hit by a virus, and then the rest were, might have been injured in combat. So it's, it was really interesting in how this became such, the Great War became so well known for its calamity, but it was actually because of things like Spanish influenza that was really dangerous. So do you know about these isolated outbreaks taking place in Eskimo villages and islands that had no contact? Um, so we did a little bit of study, such as uh, the understanding of the permafrost yeah, thing, the, about how... Um, she does a good job of that. She describes some scientists going up and literally uh, exhuming Eskimo graves up in, in Alaska. And so and, is this true? And, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, and yes. so that then leads me <clears throat> to... How did it get there? To yeah. how did it yeah. get there, which I have heard that it was because it was not the swine flu, it was a bird flu, mm -hmm. and that the geese carried it. And birds of all types carried it to these isolated places that had no human contact, but it was a bird flu, and, and the birds would fly over, and their droppings would come down, and people would become infected, and then you had an outbreak in an area with no human contact. So one of the really interesting things about the fact that this virus is that it was very highly mutatable. And so what would happen is it would transfer between different animals very quickly, and then it would also transfer to humans. So they traced it back to pigs originally, and then from that point, it basically got spread to all other forms of wildlife, including humans, uh, to the best of my knowledge. They also did, when they were researching it, there was a big period where they thought it was an avian flu yeah. before they moved on from that theory. Well, I'm awfully proud of them. Yeah. In going from Seattle
I took the North Coast train Because my time was limited I wished some time to gain I crossed the Great Columbia Where roses were in bud Then wandered into dinner And there met Dr. Spud Twas lying in a platter Sure something just immense Served with a spoon and butter And it only cost ten cents It was split right up the center Filled with butter And what's better It was sweet and hot and meaty Was it good? Well, I should stutter Oh, you great big baked potato You are Irish through and through You may talk of your onions Your garlic or stew But just try that potato It's good for you If you want a sure thing hunch For your breakfast, dinner or lunch On the NPRR in the dining car Get a great big baked potato I looked at it and smelled of it, twas sweet as any rose. I thought if I consumed it, I must loosen up my clothes. But the great big baked potato soon was lodged in my inside. And I was glad and happy on the NP road to ride. But I've been busy thinking and wondering ever since How the great big baked potato could be furnished for ten cents Of course I ordered other things and on them I did dine But I cannot forget that lovely spud It was oh so very fine Oh you great big baked potato you are Irish through and through. You may talk of your onions, your garlic or stew, but just try that potato, it's good for you. If you want a sure thing hunch for your breakfast, dinner or lunch, on the NPRR in the dining car, get a great big baked potato. Sure does the things that makes a service best. I always try to ride with them when traveling in the West. Their milk and cream and vegetables are always nice and fresh. Of course, their stuff is raised upon their farm at paradise. Then here's to the NP road, road, Dr. Spud and the man who makes you travel happily and does whatever he can to serve you well and promptly, all regardless of expense. A great big baked potato that only costs 10 cents. Oh, you great big baked potato, you are Irish through and through. You may talk of your onions, your garlic or stew, but just try that potato, it's good for you. If you want a sure thing hunch for your breakfast, dinner or lunch, on the NPRR in the dining car, get a great big baked potato. Oh!